And now we're looking at this. We're going to look at this one. Check in the case. We should have done that before. Hello, everybody. We're now live. Let me just wiggle things a little bit because we need to get Lynn in here. You want to see her far more than you do me. Um, just so you know, Lynn, we can see in this top corner who's watching, I think. So we'll just wait for people to join. And um, hi, people, if you're joining. Um, this is Min Miss Lynn Robinson. I said I'd get your name wrong. Yeah. Delighted that Lynn has given her time up for us this evening to answer um, questions that you've sent in to me about the menopause. So Lynn is an obstetrician and gynaecologist, I am reading in case you get it wrong, and leader for fertility and menopause at the Birmingham Women's Hospital. So like I say, I'm so delighted that she's given up her time this evening. We've just been having a little chat about a few things, haven't we, which yeah. are just so interesting, things that I wasn't aware of. And I think a lot of us historically have grown up with sort of preconceived ideas about going through the menopause, about HRT, um, about all the different things that we can to do to help ourselves. So it's really good to have up-to-date knowledge and information and to set all those kind of uh, fears, put them to rest, and just to be informed, really, and educated about the current state of play. So I've had lots of questions come in, and I've sectioned them down so that um, we're not sort of jumping to and fro too much between different topics. So we're going to start off, because it seemed a good place to start, by looking at the perimenopause. So I know there's a lot of people on Instagram who follow me who are probably in that stage. So um, I won't mention people's names because you just may not want to have that broadcast, but you'll probably recognise your question that, as it was sent in because I haven't really changed them at all, but I won't mention people's names. So the first one that I've got for you, Lynn, is that there's a lady who would like some advice on managing the perimenopause. She's had the progesterone only pill, but it hasn't worked for her and she can't decide what to do next? Uh, well, the perimenopause is quite difficult to diagnose because most women will get symptoms of the menopause, flushes and sweats or irregular bleeding, but there's no harm in taking HRT during that time because the progesterone only pill is not going to sort out the symptoms they've got. Um, it'll act as a contraceptive, and if they need a contraceptive, you can take HRT on top of using the mini pill. Mm -hmm. You actually need... HRT is not licensed as contraception, so if you need contraception, you take both. Right. But um, she would use a, we'd recommend a sequential HRT. She still regulates your periods, so she'd probably have a period on it. Um, but it should control the symptoms, and there's absolutely no harm in taking that. It should make her feel a lot better. Okay, okay, that's great. So I hope that's helpful then. Moving on to the next question. Are there any over-the-counter supplements for perimenopause, so vitamins and mineral type things? I've had lots of people sort of ask about vitamins and minerals, nutrition. Is there anything else that you can suggest other than sort of prescribed drugs? Um, and do they conflict and sort of work well, they can, against them? I mean, women that are... There's very few women that would say she shouldn't have HRT. And so there's some women, women that have previously had an estrogen positive breast cancer, we're reluctant. We do sometimes prescribe it, but we're reluctant to prescribe it. So they're, they have, their cohort of women that have to be very careful to avoid some herbal remedies like St John's Wort or whatever that may have what we call sort of phytoestrogens in them. So right. they do have to be little, so some of them you have to be a little bit careful with. So I would honestly say to the women that want the vitamins, the minerals, etc., why do you want those, why do you not want conventionally HRT or, you know, what you're worried about? That was a conversation I normally have right. while you're avoiding it. If you want it as a supplement, then most of them, like multivitamins, are, are fine to take with it. Okay. There are some that you have to be... So, um, black cohosh, red clover, those are often used as alternatives, but you probably shouldn't take those with HRT because they may have phytoestrogens in them. So there's nothing that you could take that might delay you needing to start HRT? HRT. I suppose your point is you shouldn't... Why, yeah, why are you avoiding it? Uh, there are some that can help. Black cohosh can help, red clover can help, St John's wort can help, but they can interact with other medications, so you really should be taking them and asking your GP about it rather than just going ahead and buying it yourself. Okay. And, and what about in general for women who perhaps don't have really severe symptoms, so may not warrant HRT, but is there anything for women sort of my age that you, or would that just be like a multivitamin? And uh, multivitamins can help exercise, you know, just all the, the usual lifestyle things that can help. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you want something to take the edge off your hot flushes and sweats, there isn't really anything much better. There's nothing as good as oestrogen. There are some prescribed okay. medicines that can help, like clonidine is a drug that can help, um, benlafaxine is an antidepressant which is very good, it's good, for, well, relatively good for hot flushes and good for mood changes, but if you're wanting something really to combat the, what we call vasomotor symptoms, so night sweats and hot flushes, mm -hmm. 
being honest, it, estrogen's the drug that's really going to hit. Because that's the thing we're missing. Yeah, that's the thing you're missing. <laughs> and actually, most women, I suppose what I would normally tackle in my clinic is why, why are you avoiding it, what are you worried about? And try and put those fears at rest because yeah. most people can have HRT and most people benefit from it. Okay. Very few women that can't have it actually. Okay, all right. So we'll we'll come to more on the HRT thing yeah. in a minute. You can give us the the full lowdown. So one of the questions is how do you know if you're menopausal? So how do you know if you're actually at the menopause stage? And this lady said, I have a marina coil fitted, so the twelve month period for it doesn't apply. Yeah, She's not getting the periods. I get hot at night, brain fog, and the odd hot flush, but nothing consistent and no pattern. I put it all down to the menopause, but how do I really know? Um, so it's more difficult when you've got a marina coil or you've had a hysterectomy because you don't have the lack of periods to give you some insight. Mm. But we would go by the symptoms. So um, our new guidelines are if you're over the age of 45, we don't do a hormone level. We just go by the symptoms because it's most likely if you've got hot flushes, sweats, brain fog, that it's estrogen deprivation is causing it right if you're younger we'll do serial hormone levels about six weeks apart to get an idea of if, if that's the reason for it because there can be other reasons why younger women might be but well it's usually because of the, the lack of periods but if they haven't got a marina coil or had a hysterectomy there's often other reasons why the periods aren't regular um with the marina coil, I would normally, e even if they've got marina coil and not bleeding, if they've got hot flushes and sweats and you're late 40s, early 50s, I would say you probably need oestrogen. It's menopause. Okay. You don't need any more investigations than that, really. Okay. So it's, yeah. if it's, I don't even know what the phrase is. That I want. Now that's the menopause. <laughs> yeah, I won't even go menopause. there. I'll forget that one. I've got a good story about that later. <laughs> if I remember to tell you, actually, a really good menopause brain fog type story that came in the other day. Um... Okay, so and then the next question uh, is how do you know at what, what stage you're at, as in how far the, through the menopause you are, and how, how do you know when you need HRT? It, there's kind of a common theme, yeah, isn't I mean, there? Any, any time in the sort of perimenopause, to to <laughs> any time that you need HR, HRT, because the menopause, so symptoms of the menopause, the median time that goes on for seven years, unfortunately. So is that it? it? Yeah, seven years yeah, that's the median wow. time. It can go on for someone that go on for much longer than that, or someone that's shorter than that. So I think the state, people sort of worry about the stages. You're, the menopause is a retrospective diagnosis. We can tell you've gone through it when you're 12 months since your last period. That's the yeah. diagnosis. But clearly, some women have had a hysterectomy, had a marina coil, it's hard to know. Mm. So I think... Being honest, it doesn't really matter what stage you're yeah. at. If you're having symptoms, you still need treated. And some women are 10 years down the line of having their last period and still have symptoms and still need treated. So is it it's more of a... reason to worry about it. Is it more of a shift we need just to accept we are where we are? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah. I suppose we're quite used to being in control of things and understanding the pattern. And this is something that doesn't have a clear start and a clear end and clear and stages, does it? You so can't just control it because you're, some women don't get any symptoms. And it's mm. often familiar. And if your mum had an easy menopause and you were like to easy menopause, mm. some women have horrific symptoms and flush for 20 years mm. and, and I have women in the 70s and 80s that when I take them off HRT they have a horrific and they end up going back on it again and the, I have a strong opinion that there, there's good evidence now to suggest that women should just stay on it if if when they come off it they're struggling let just keep them on it get them to the lowest level that oh, controls right. the symptoms and yeah. let them stay on it because you're putting them more at risk by stopping and starting it all the time okay. you best let people stay on it so we need to recondition ourselves and learn to just like, accept where we are yeah, in the moment yeah, and because there's nothing you can do to control it. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing you can do to make it better other than take a drug to help control it. You can improve your lifestyle, you can lose, but sometimes weight gain or weight loss can affect your flushes and sweats. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. other than that, you know, I think you probably have to accept that medication is the one thing that can yeah. really help. It. Okay, well that's, that's good to know. So... Um, this lady has asked, how do you know when you're at the end? I haven't asked this question, have I? Though we've sort of covered it. But what she said is, I'm trying to get through the menopause naturally. Now, you might have something that you want yeah. to say about that. Because I'm kind of that sort of, I don't like taking things. I'm rubbishing at remembering to take things. And I'd rather do it naturally. <laughs> but you may say, come on, Beth. Yeah. Just, um, I've experienced two bouts of hot flushes, which have been about a year apart, and which have each lasted for six weeks. I stopped having periods about 10 months ago, although I am now having one. I'm 55 and wonder whether I'm nearly at the end, which would be brilliant as they're the only symptoms that she's had. Although her husband may disagree on that, <laughs> which I really liked. I thought that was a great... I think, 
you know, it's, it's very much a personal choice. Nobody has to take HRT, but it, it, it depends how much the symptoms are bothering you. If they're mm. disrupting your life, if they're stopping you working, stopping you sleeping, then I would always say it's like, you know, it's sort of like trying on a dress. Why don't you try some HRT for three months? Mm. And if you don't like it, stop it. You haven't done yourself any harm. And if you do like it, continue with it. Yeah. You know, it's, you might as well have a trial of yeah. it, you know. So you probably wouldn't keep a dress for three months and then send it back. <laughs> well, you know? some people would. I'd be surprised. <laughs> but, so it's fairly simple. Simple, yeah, yeah, you can just give it a go, try it. And if you don't like it, well, you know, maybe try a different formula, a different, yeah. different formulation. But if you still don't like it, it's not helping you, well, then it's not the thing for you and yeah. stop taking it. Right, okay, okay. Oh, that's good. I like that one. And we'll, might say, we'll come on to HRT a little bit more. So, um, one lady said, what have I lost? I'm genuinely very bamboozled about what I've lost, other than my lady <laughs> Enid, <laughs> and how I replace any chemicals to bolster the HRT. Does that... Um, so, I think what... I presume what she's meaning is the HR sort of hormones that she's lost. Think, yeah. or does she want something as well as the HRT? I don't know, I'm not quite sure actually. Um, so, if, if she's lost her in, oh, she's probably had a hysterectomy, yeah. in which case she just really needs estrogen, would be the hormone that we would give to help yeah. replace that. Yeah. And some women have a loss of libido when they lose their, often if they've got their ovaries taken out as well. Not It can be without that, but more, more commonly in surgical menopause, mm-hmm. and testosterone can help that. So, a little bit of testosterone supplementation. But if she's looking for something more natural, then I would just say multivitamins and minerals. And if you if you totally don't want to put down the HRT, the sort of prescribed HRT route, then things like black co wash, red clover, mm-hmm. St John's wort can help. But you, I wouldn't advise doing that without the GP overseeing it. And a GP is normally quite helpful with those. I suppose it depends on the GP you see. Or it depends on the GP you see. They're often quite helpful with that. A lot of GPs are worried about prescribing conventional HRT more so than worrying about prescribing the alternatives. And that's because it's been, there's been so much conflicting evidence about it. They're like, mm. you know, I see it all the time, so it's different for me. A GP has many other things to look yeah. at. Therefore, you know, it's yet another thing to worry about. And they're often more yeah. conservative about prescribing right. anything. And okay. that's why women end up getting sent into tertiary care for it. Um, this lady also says that she has such an itchy scalp. Is that something that you come across? Is that mentioned too um, much? Not very commonly, but um, skin I don't know she's, yeah, skin changes happen in the menopause. Women can develop acne in the menopause, which is the opposite of what you think would happen. And my skin's on the <laughs> <or> something. <laughs> Sorry, not on the screen at all. I'm like, oh, I didn't really have bad skin as a teenager. Yeah, yeah. Like, What's going on? And I don't think... It's not always entirely clear why. It was just, there, might, there is a fluctuation in the hormones, and some women do get um, sort of lower estrogen. It's still got, it's sort of imbalanced because the testosterone doesn't go down as quickly as the estrogen does. And I think sometimes that can cause a bit of acne that will eventually go, but it's a transition. The itchy scalp, I'm not sure, it, that may be just a dry scalp. She may have dry skin to go along with itchy okay. scalp. And I would just use emollients. Um, Again, HRT might help her, but if she wanted something more conventional, you know, she get more links to GP. Okay, so GP for, for that. Yeah. Okay, so now this is on to HRT. Um, I'd like to know what are the benefits of taking HRT other than relieving certain symptoms? Do our bodies need it? My doctor said I would bleed for a year as to start off with. They give a certain kind of HRT. I've been bleeding like hell without it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't fancy that. I hit my very early at 38 and I'm feeling robbed. Oh, well, she, she doesn't have to go. It, it, you know, so if people, if a woman's still having periods, having menopausal symptoms, we would put her on an HRT that would give her a natural, give her a, a regular period mm-hmm. because otherwise she'll bleed erratically. But if she doesn't want that, we can insert a marina coil because it can act as part of the HRT to avoid that. So oh, it's not yeah. absolutely mandatory she has to go through that. But if she's still bleeding a lot, I would actually say a marina coil might be the best thing for her. And then, obviously not for the contraceptive side of things, it's more for the bleeding, if you yeah. bleeding, and then she can have oestrogen separately. Okay, that's good to know. Because I remember when my mum was going through it, it she suffered massively yeah. with, with loss of blood, and it just, she it's, looked terrible, she looked anaemic, and she was in the local town, and they'd have to sort her out, and it's just no. awful, but women don't need to do it. The marina coil do. wasn't around then. No, it wasn't around then, it's been around since, well, since the 90s. So, yeah, so she can have that and have estrogen separately from it. And that would, 
I think I would sort of sort her out. The benefit, well, she wants to know about the benef benefits of taking HRT. Certainly through the menopause at 38, bone protection is really important. Having just seen my mum with a fractured femur, I wish she'd listened to me. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So bone protection is really important. And it's also appears to be cardioprotective. Certainly women on the age of 50, we'd okay. say we'd really, really encourage them to take it. Um, if you've had a menopause on the age of 40, then... Sorry. <laughs> well, that's just a little interruption. We've got dinner going on. Turn so. it off. Turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> I can't read that from here. Yeah. If they need more, continue with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> A bit of dialogue with Lynn's yeah. husband going on Murder's yeah. dinner. I mean, it's really yeah. good of you to get up your time. You've got a house full tonight, haven't you? So, um, so this, like, you, so you're saying, and I think I can actually remember this. Pre, so, if you hit menopause pre fifty, then it's good to take HRT to protect your bone and cardiovascular. Yeah, and, and post fifty. It's and good, post fifty, that but it's more. It's especially important for younger women, and I think the thing that women do need. Lots of women worry about breast cancer, and under the age of 50, there's no evidence to suggest that it has any effect on your breast cancer risk. So the younger women don't really need to worry about that. The, old, the woman over the age of 50, then there is some evidence that combined HRT has got estrogen and progesterone in it, so that's if you haven't had a hysterectomy. Though that may increase your risk very slightly, like four extra women per thousand in the five So we're period. talking, you can run a little bit more in the middle. Okay. Okay. So we're talking. Um, it's much lower risk than it's the same, roughly the same risk as of drinking a glass of wine a day. Oh really? Yeah. So if you're worried about that, then why are you worried about taking it? You know, and it's equivalent to that. You can reduce your risk back down to nothing, no extra risk if you take exercise regularly about three times a week. But your risk goes up much more if your BMI is over thirty. So I think the sort of message is to try and just keep your yeah, yeah done if you and, can. And that will and that's yeah. that's really interesting to know actually how all these things yeah. because the one of the next questions that, that I'll just tie in with this as well, um, is so when is the right time to stay start HRT? So when you start getting symptoms or when, you know, if your doctor says I think you've gone through the menopause, mm -hmm. then that's the right time. So for younger women certainly if they're going through the, if they've been told they're going through the menopause early, that's the time to mm -hmm. start. For women at the age of 50 to start getting symptoms, mm -hmm. then I think that's the time to start. And, and I think if, you're, if you've got a family history of osteoporosis, it's worth talking to your doctor about it, because that's another, even if you're not symptomatic, that is the other indication. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I've always thought of, and I think it's because of the way we were brought up and all the scares around HRT, that it was like a last resort. You no, kind of battle it's and you do what you can and you only do it if you have yeah. if you're suffering beyond belief. But you're kind of suggesting No, and it's the that. only thing that can protect you against osteoporosis. All the other drugs um, for bone sort of to treat osteoporosis, they treat it once you've got it. Estrogen's the only thing that can actually help prevent you getting it. Right. And I think for a lot when you see the trauma and morbidity from having a, a fracture, especially a fractured femur. It's huge, it kills people, you know, that's yeah. the thing that kills 80 year olds and it's not, it's, oh, often it's more tragic than something to do with cardiovascular disease or it's actually more common than breast cancer, so I think, you know, well, you have to, to think a little bit. To what extent can it protect you? So could there be an 80 year old who could still have the same bones as a 50 year old if she, is it complete? You know, it, so it, it protects work? you as long as you're on it right. and it can last, the longer you're on it, the effects, the bone protection can last longer when you stop taking it right so there is some protective effect when you stop taking it but it will dwindle with time yeah um but does it stop it does it stop the decline at all does it just it maintain can, it, it works yeah, so yeah, if it i can started maintain, it tomorrow it would it can maintain where I am now. Now. yeah yeah That's it may you may not get you sometimes get better than what you are now really? or it may just maintain where you are rather than dipping down and what about on the cardiovascular side as well then so you said that it can help protect against yeah, cardiovascular so it can, disease How so it can work? help protect because well i don't get, so the analogy I use is, <laughs> it's very crude, but if you think of your drains being blocked up, if you keep flushing them through with drain cleaner and keeping them clean, then that's a good thing, isn't it? Everything flushes down easily. Mm -hmm. If you let all the, so we think of plaques on the vessels build up, so if you think of like all the dirt um, clogging up in your drains, if you then suddenly give a slug of drain cleaner, it will, it'll just fire off lots of, Bits oh, of dirt, yeah, yeah, that's dangerous because that's when you can suddenly have a cardiac event. If you suddenly 
give somebody a big slug of oestrogen, they've not had any for 10 years, you give them a big dose of it, then you can break off lots of plaques in the vessels and that could cause a cardiac event. Whereas if you've kept them clean all those years, right. then you're preventing that happening. So that's what oestrogen does. It right. keeps them basically clear. Right. So if you've been on oestrogen from the time of the natural menopause, you've not let that build up. Hmm. Whereas the danger is if you give somebody at the age of 65, sorry my dog's appeared. You can be on it as well, <laughs> let's be that um, Then everything may have built up and they suddenly, it's maybe dangerous to give it to them then. Right. So I think the important thing is if we... If you start it at your team and you need it when you're getting symptoms, then that's the safest time to take it so and prevent it. What if you never have any symptoms? Is it still a good idea to take it anyway for your cardiovascular and your bone density? So we're not supposed to do that. No. Okay. <laughs> but I do a little cardiologist in London that always says that when a woman says she's no symptoms, he just turns the heating up in his clinic. Oh, really? and symptoms. So he's very, very pro that we should, be, but strictly speaking, we're supposed to prescribe it for three reasons. One, symptoms. The other one's of osteoporosis or treatment of it and the other one's premature menopause we're not supposed to primarily do it for cardiovascular disease so how does it, it doesn't stop how does it stop premature menopause so it, it doesn't stop, stop it but it just no it just to treat it just to treat so it. somebody goes through the menopause early we very even if they're not having symptoms we would say so you run be through honest. those again so if you're symptomatic say like my age i turn up and go i've got hot flesh ears brain fog <laughs> then you we should, we're, we're okay. not the so that, then. yeah and then the next one osteoporosis so if i turned up and you do they do scans to check your bone density yes or if you said that you'd had a previous fracture or because you, your gp can do a sort of a risk assessment okay. um, if you've had a previous previous fracture or if you've got a strong family history um or you're at risk yourself like you if you're very slim or you know and, and some women that they have various risk factors they may be smokers or you know there's various other things mm-hmm. then that's reasonable to offer it to them and any that's their premature menopause even if they don't have symptoms you should say you should be on that right yeah okay Okay. Oh, golly, I'm learning so much. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning so much. So, another lady said, um, what about the fact that the pharmacists have run out of HRT? Doctors are prescribing mm-hmm. and it's out of stock when you go to collect. I'm furious. <laughs> I like this bit. This wouldn't happen if bloody men had to take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a problem. So, um, the good news is we've not totally run out of HRT. We've run out of certain products and that's apparently not because of Brexit. Apparently it's because the particular... Um, companies that are making it uh, have got a shortage or production problems and they say it's in other countries in Europe and South America it's not just the UK mm-hmm. but we have on the, so if anybody's worried or the GP's not able to help them if you go on the British Menopause Society website there's a page telling you what alternatives you can take you know what HRT is not available and what the oh really uh, yeah what a viable alternative is that is available and most HRTs are probably going to be available by Sort of early 2020 so i'm hoping sort of march april time they should all be back. Sure, sure, sure. so how many different types of hrt are there because it's talked about in a very generic sense isn't it are they yeah. impact, like, is that, are there five ten twenty so oh there's loads but i always used to think it was like going into a sweet shop and you'd have all the rooms <laughs> so you didn't know which one to choose but it's very if you think about it logically there's there's your estrogen only which for women that have had a hysterectomy so that's easy so, okay, you can, so hysterectomy, hysterectomy is estrogen, estrogen only yeah. women that have got a uterus you've got Oestrogen and progesterone, or oestrogen and marina coil, are right. usually the two. Um, you've then got, then it becomes a little bit more complicated, if you're still having periods, we'll put you on one that you have a bleed on. Yeah. If you're not having periods, and you've not had one within 12 months, then we'll put you on one you don't have a bleed on, or a marina coil, one okay. of the two. Um, and then, so those are the main ones, and then you've got your oral or your transdermals. What's transdermal? So transdermal is patch or gel. Okay. My mum um, used to have those. You just find them in the shower. <laughs> well, they're probably, yeah, they're probably the, I would say if you ask what the gold standard is, I would say transdermal. Okay. Um, not many transdermal combined ones. So you'll have a transdermal with a separate progesterone or a marina coil. And that's because transdermal's got the benefits of, doesn't increase your blood clotting risk. So the one disadvantage of HRT is if you take it orally, you increasing your sort of venous blood clotting risk, the, blood, or the risk of having a blood clot in the leg or one that breaks off to the lungs. Um, if you take a transdermal, you don't increase that risk. If you've got migraines or epilepsy, it's fine to take a transdermally. Even if you're at risk of a stroke, it doesn't increase your risk of stroke. So there's all those other things that right. um, it's got the advantages of. But oral is perfectly safe for women that don't have those extra risk factors. So those are... I don't know if that's made it more complicated. Yeah, so that's the general... But the thing is, I'm going to throw a slight curveball here because you're... So really, we need to be seeing somebody like you 
who knows all of it. Like GPs are brilliant, but they're not going to know. Yeah, I'm not trying to increase my base this. Really. No, no, <laughs> yeah. but well, they're not going to know a lot. But most women, the GP is perfectly capable. A lot of the GPs have come to train with me, so a lot of them know their subject incredibly well. But if you've got, if you're I suppose the woman that comes to see me are the woman with what we would call comorbidities. So they've got a risk of hi- history of a blood clot, history of stroke, breast cancer, etc. Mm. They're often the ones that come and see me. Or the women, very commonly, they've tried everything under the sun and nothing suits them. So I'm everything HRT-wise or yeah, natural? Both. It, they've tried lots of HRTs. Now they bleed erratically or it doesn't, it doesn't improve your symptoms. And some women, so what I haven't touched on is we do have an implant clinic. So some women end up with an estrogen implant, just a pellet under the skin. It's a small surgical procedure we do it in clinic. And that, I I can't think of a patient I've had that hasn't worked on. It works brilliantly. But it does involve having to come back every six months for a repeat implant. Because it dissolves under the skin and then you have to... Where do you put it? Where does it go? Um... So uh, what we call the iliac fossa, so one side of the pelvic, one side of the abdomen, or the other side, the alternate sides. Okay. You can put it in the buttocks, right. but most people put it in the abdomen. And then every six months you come back and have it, and it's just a slow release thing. It's just a slow release estrogen pellet, and we sometimes give testosterone as well. So if you've had a hysterectomy, you have to have something else with it. So you'll have to take a progesterone tablet or a, have a marine coiling. If you've had a hysterectomy, it's all you need. Right. Um, and it's more common in women that have had a hysterectomy because they're often the women, they quite often are women that have had it early, they're younger, nothing is really getting on top of their symptoms, they don't absorb so well and that's the thing that really helps them. We just have to be careful about their estrogen levels because they get quite a high dose initially and then it goes down. Can you check estrogen levels once something like that's been put in as mm-hmm. a way of measuring so you can monitor? We have to do it for the estrogen implants. Um, well, some will, some people don't, but it generally accept that we should do that, so they don't go too high. Mm. Transdermals, the patches and the gels, we can do it because you get a very even release of hormone in the bloodstream. You can't do it reliably with somebody taking tablets because your hormones are going up and down all the time, so you can't do it with them. But you can with the others. So you would say taking tablets, what kind of? Tablets? So if you take an estrogen tablet, you okay. just oral HRT. Okay, you so can't, you can't really measure okay. that. But it's very helpful in other women because it tells me whether there's. You don't need to have your estrogen levels monitored, so right. you don't want really anybody to go away thinking they have to get it done. But if you're not responding to treatment, it's very useful to do it. Right. If you're on a patch or gel, because then we know whether you're absorbing it or not. So, do any of us really need to be suffering? No. <laughs> there's a there's a subsector of women that will have already been they'll already know who they are that have been told they shouldn't have HRT. There's many risks mm. with it. And most commonly, that's the woman that had a previous breast cancer, and it'll be usually been an estrogen positive, even estrogen negative. It's we have to be very careful because those women can have a um, recurrence of breast cancer that can be a different type of tumor. It can be an estrogen mm-hmm. positive recurrence. So they are women, and I'm not saying we never we do. I do have women I see that I give estrogen to that have had a breast cancer, but they they're usually women we've had a long discussion with and they've tried other things and it's a qual- it's a, it's an issue quality of life versus yeah. risk yeah because we don't actually have any hard evidence to say that it makes you have a breast cancer recurrence right um but it's counterintuitive that if you've had a tumor due to yeah. breast cancer due to you know linked with estrogen that you then they, you then give people estrogen yeah, sure. so it's very difficult yeah. so they're the one group it's difficult with most other women can have it. Okay, okay, right, I'll move on to a few more questions because I'm conscious that your time is... <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> uh, one lady says, I'm on HRT patches and I'm suffering really badly with wind. Is there anything I can do? Ooh, uh, I've not, I've not been asked that before. No, but um, I think she could try lowering the dose or if, if that doesn't work, she could try... Uh, so it depends, if, if it's correcting everything else for her, mm-hmm. then... Um, she could try some. She may want an irritable bowel, and she could try something like mevaverine you can get from the GP, um, to try and help with that. Mm-hmm. If that doesn't work, then maybe try a different topic. You know, she could try estrogen gel, which is very like the patches. It's the same. You still use it transdermally, and it should work just as well. But it's a different product, so she might find yeah. that helps. So that might just make it. Yeah. Or could it be? I didn't realize this. Someone, one of our good friends who you work with, told me the other day that your pe- because your pelvic floor muscles weaken. 
it could, that, yeah, yeah, it and could that it to, could be coincidental. It could be to do with Possibly. that, and, she, and it's worth getting examined to see if she, she might have a bit of prolapse, or it could be so a bit of physio. And sometimes, if you do have a bit of prolapse, the physio, she, you may need something surgically done about it. But it's more likely that just you know, yeah, some exercises can help. Okay. Vaginal estrogen can help, probably not with the wind side of things, but it can help plump up the tissues in the vagina and it certainly helps that's the thing I haven't touched on vaginal dryness is a big issue yeah and um, a lot of women get what we call urogenital symptoms they get urinary incontinence and sort of urgency and pain urinating and a bit of vaginal estrogen can help that and that's linked to the menopause isn't it mm, yeah so vagi- some women can only be troubled by vaginal dryness that's their main symptom then that can be linked with lack of libido because clearly if it hurts every time you have intercourse mm. then that's going to put you off so vaginal estrogens can be used, just local vaginal so vagina, vagina or estrogen tablet that you put in the vagina every night and then for a couple of weeks and then twice weekly. And you can use that as, much, as long as you want. It doesn't overdose if you're taking other HRT, it doesn't matter, right. or you could use it as own. Um, just touch on the need to go to the loo urgently as well. So that's so the that can be, well. So when you think when you're, um, the vagina, we call the vaginal muc- mucosis, the lining of the vagina, when it when you lose estrogen, that sort of thins out. Mm-hmm. Some people don't say dries up, but it thins out. It then causes, it's like sandpaper. A lot of people describe it as sandpaper. It obviously hurts if you've been to course. It hurts being examined, and it can sting going to the toilet. Right. So, and if you have a prolapse, certainly if you need any surgical intervention, you heal much better if you've been using estrogen. Okay. So, although you can take what we call systemic estrogen tablets, traditional HRT, transdermal, it often doesn't have as good an effect in the vagina as oral estrogen does. So an estrogen cream or tablet can work really well and you can use it. it I think people always say, oh, I'm taking two, that and systemic HRT, yeah. that's going to be overdosing. So I'd always tell patients that if they use the vaginal estrogen for a year, that's the equivalent to one of their HRT patches on a year or one tablet. Oh, okay. That's how much you absorb into your bloodstream. Right. So even people with breast cancer can use that. Mm. So, you know, it's very safe and it's incredibly effective. So much of this seems to be about putting things into context, doesn't it? And explaining it, you see like four in every thousand. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 I think people, are, like what I said to you before we started, I think women's biggest fear, if you do, if you, very good surveys on it, if you ask them what they're worried about, what they're worried of dying of, they always say breast cancer. But actually that's probably one of the lowest... <laughs> The much lower risk than cardiovascular <coughs> disease. That's the right. highest, that's the thing that's most likely to kill us in the USA or in the UK. So that's um, the thing we should be protecting against. And HRT against. can protect uh, Yeah, right. yeah. I think we're much Amazing. more worried about, because clearly cancer is a, a horrible thing to go through and a horrible condition. That's the thing we're most worried about, but actually it's probably less, it's less likely to happen to us than... Okay. Wow, so, so much knowledge coming yes. through here, Lynn. <laughs> right, so topical estrogen. You kind of already touched on that, haven't you? So, ladies, saying, could you give your opinion on topical estrogen, please? Oh, so absolutely. I, I can't think of a contraindication to it other than if you've had breast cancer and you're on something we call an aromatase inhibitor, then we need to talk to the oncologist about it. But that still, it's not total contraindication. So that's just a specific group of women. But other than that, um, some women may have had may have difficulty putting anything into the vagina just being practical about mm-hmm. it it can be difficult they may have arthritis they may just you know may have had surgery so there is a new drug that's just come on the market in the uk called ospemifen which um you can use orally so it's not a license so it kind of is just as good as an effect as local estrogen does and it acts in the vagina so um that's sort of another alternative. That's amazing. How does it know just to work well? I don't know, oh, actually. <laughs> That's amazing, that, isn't it? I know, but it's it? supposed to be as effective. And apparently, the um, it's more user-friendly. People stick with it longer because they find it easier to use okay. than putting anything in the vagina. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a lady's saying she's been um, com- prescribed combined HRT as she suffers with migraines. She knows that patches would be more suitable but she's heard that they're difficult to get hold of, so what is the best form of HRT for migraine sufferers? Oh, right, so that's easy. Oh, so <laughs> I'm a migraine sufferer. Too. So at the moment, yes, she's right. The combined patch is very difficult to get hold of. You can get hold of it. Um, the pharmacy at Bernard Women's has a small stock of it, but 
um, there is an alternative. When they actually, if you to ask about the gold standard, the, the alternative is probably better, but it's just a bit more complicated. So it's an estrogen patch, and then because it's estrogen only, you've got to take your progesterone separately. But there's a micronized progesterone that's a natural progesterone that actually, in all, all the trials that have been done, although they're smaller trials than the sort of big trials in the ninth in sort of the turn of the century. Um, they suggest it's probably more cardiovascularly beneficial and doesn't appear to increase the risk of breast cancer. So actually it's a very safe and very few side effects. So, but that progesterone has to be taken separately from the, and it's orally, separately from the estrogen patch. It can be used, so the progesterone can be used orally or vaginally. So you have the estrogen patch. And you replace that twice a week. Right. And then you have the progesterone tablet every day. And we usually tell them to take it at night because it can make them a little bit sleepy. So most but, women like that. But what about if the difficulty getting hold of the patches? So you're saying that that should all be sorted? The estrogen only patch you can get hold of. So oh. the combined patch has got both hormones in it. So it's easier because you only have to take one product. You only have to use a combined patch, change it twice a week, and that's everything. So this is a little bit more complicated than you have to use an estrogen-only patch and a separate oh, progesterone. Yeah. But actually, overall, it might be the safest form of HRT or the most beneficial form of HRT. I'm going to ask you a really silly question now because I haven't quite got my head around the interaction between estrogen and progesterone. But sometimes you have estrogen only, sometimes yeah. you have it with progesterone, depending on whether... So, yeah, it's all to do with whether you've had hysterectomy or not. So okay. if you... Um, the only hormone you need to protect your bones, protect your heart, and to help your menopausal symptoms is estrogen. Right. And actually, overall, being honest, it's the, probably the safest form of EHRT you can get. It doesn't appear to increase the risk of breast cancer at all. It's cardiovascular protective, bone protective. But if you haven't had a hysterectomy, you've got to have something to protect the lining of the womb, the endometrium, because if you constantly hit it with progesterone, or sorry, with estrogen when you're older, then you're at higher risk of endometrial cancer. So you've got to protect it with the right. progesterone that you would okay. normally have if you're having a menstrual cycle. Okay. So that's why you have to two different types if you've still got so a So if you've uterus. still got a womb, you've got a boat. You've got a boat. Or a marina coil and okay. that'll do the progesterone bit. Right, okay. So we've we've sort of looked at um, alternatives to HRT and herbal su herbal supplements, haven't we? This lady said um, she had a radical hysterectomy and her ovaries were removed at 43 due to cervical cancer. She's in a medically induced menopause and taking HRT. Would you recommend taking herbal supplements so I can wean myself off HRT? I'm now 45 and menopause symptoms are still very strong. Oh, so I read that earlier and I was thinking, oh, she should just stay on it. She really should stay on it. There's no reason. So the cervical cancer is not linked with estrogen at all. And she's only 45. So I think she should... When I read that, I thought, I hope somebody's like, told that she just stay on it. I wouldn't wean her off it at all. No. I think I'd really advise her to stay on it until she's 50, at least, and then think about if she wants to come off it. That's her choice then. Yeah. But I really would, if she saw me in clinic, I'd be pushing her to stay on it. Because right. it's more benefits. She's very young to have gone through all that. And you know, it's very young to lose your ovaries as well. Mm -hmm. And I think she'd benefit from staying on it. And if okay. she wants to then come off it, then... The herbal things were the things I'd mentioned before, like black cohosh and red clover can help. Mm. Um, and there's other non-hormonal, non non-herbal things like the clonidine and the venipax that the GP would have to prescribe mm. those. But really for her, I'd strongly advise her to stay on it. Okay. She's doing okay. herself a lot of good staying on it. Um, brain fog. <laughs> so this lady says, memory is definitely my biggest worry. I'm 51 and it's shocking. Is this a menopause symptom or an age issue? If it is, then what can be done about it? It's worrying. There might be... Um, the, and then this other lady, and she sent me a message yesterday as well. She said, I'd love to know what can help with concentration and brain fog. The only time I remember what I go in a room for is when I go to the bathroom. Seriously, though, it would be so helpful. I have thyroid problems and diabetes, so I really need help with this menopause Ooh. malarkey. But just quickly to tell you the thing that this lady sent me yesterday, if I can get it right, and she said... Okay, this is my, my menopause brain fog. This is the first one of the year. Turn the house upside down. Book tickets for something. Looking for them. Knew they'd come. Turn the house. Frantic. Couldn't find them. Rang the box office. They said, we haven't even sent them out. And we noticed that the event you were coming to was to do with the menopause. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Yes. Oh, there's a menopause musical. Maybe, that was... <laughs> maybe that's what it was. Maybe yeah, it was yeah. the menopause musical. Yeah. She's like, oh. oh. Um, so. Yeah, so I think it's a combination of age and menopause being honest but I think most women 
it does seem to be strongly linked with the menopause. And the HRT does seem to improve the brain fog. So I think I mean, she should probably make, I'm sure she's done this already, but make sure her thyroid is um, sort of, no, her thyroid functions normal, because mm-hmm. that can affect it as well. Um, and obviously the diabetes, but I'm sure she's already looked at that. So I would say she can certainly go on HRT. Um, the, there's good evidence that actually it doesn't affect your diabetic control. And for any people worried about diabetes, it seems to protect against you developing type 2 diabetes. So that's a diabetes. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's not something else. So it certainly doesn't, impo- doesn't affect your sugar control at all uh, or thyroid problems. So there's no reason why she can't go and on it. So if a patient comes to you and says that they've got thyroid problems, and how do you have to gather all the notes in from everything or do you have multidisciplinary meetings? Or how does um, it work? So the G- usually it's a GP referral in, in the NHS and they will... Have attached all the oh, all, all the relevant yeah. notes. Otherwise, I have to write different specialties and sort. Yeah. So people, so ha- just remind. We were talking about this earlier. I think I said people can come and see you in two different ways, can't they? Can be referred through the GP, but they don't have to live in Birmingham to do that. No, they don't. So if they come and see me in the NHS, they can be referred through the GP, or if you live out of region, but there's nobody, no provider out of region. Like some patients come to see me from Wales, mm-hmm. or sort of. Where else um, was it? Somewhere quite a long way. Uh, Blackpool. Blackpool. <laughs> yes, Blackpool. Yeah. Did I make that? So, up? if Blackpool. there isn't a provider there, then they can come and see me. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, you can see me privately <laughs> if you want. And there, they don't have to. So they can just ring. They can just ring. Yeah, and you're out. So Lynn is at the N H no the B M I Priory Hospital Edgbaston. Yeah. Isn't it B M I Priory Hospital yeah. Edgbaston? How often do you have a clinic there? Once a week. Oh, do you? And then how often do you have the clinics at the women's? Oh, there's not, so I do a clinic once a week mm-hmm. um, because all the rest of the time I'm doing fertility stuff. But I have, I think there's five clinics a week. Oh, really? And we still, we still have a six-month wait. Really? So, so it's yeah. six months to, to get to see yeah. you on the NHS. How long have those clinics been going? Because I've not heard about them. Oh, so we, we were them. the first menopause, well, long before me, but we are the first menopause service in the UK. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first menopause society. So we've got a West Midlands menopause society. And actually, members of the public, it's usually, I think members of the public can come if they want, but um, there's lectures we do twice a year. But it's more suitable for GPs, mm. nurses, consultants, because we have a lecture and then go through various case studies afterwards. But we are, yeah, we're, I think we're the only local menopause society left. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And do most other big cities, do their women's hospitals or their whatever hospitals have menopause clinics or not really? How many are there in the country, just oh as an idea? Because if you're seeing people from Wales and Blackpool, yeah, there's not there's so, many. So the nearest one to us is um, Oxford, I think, have a clinic. Um, it doesn't appear to be anything in the West Country, and that's why we get people from Wales. So there's not uh, there's some in London, some um, in the Northwest, and then Scotland. But there's there is not that many providers, and that's there's not that many trainers. So that's why we've got a long waiting list for GPs wow. to train with us. I've got twenty GPs waiting on my really? waiting list. Yeah, yeah. So come and train with you. Yeah, so that they can then. Well, the idea is then they can provide. Yeah. a menopause clinic within their surgery yeah. so people don't have to wait to be referred yeah. in so hopefully it'll get better but it's so it needs to doesn't it again like that lady was saying earlier because men were involved in this <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't say that but I, I feel know, that things would be very different <laughs> if that was the case um, okay so this lady said I'd love to have the discussion about low mood and do all the symptoms start at the same time low mood is my biggie at the moment I have started exercising to try and combat that but it seems to be my only symptom if indeed it is menopause related I am 48 so, I mean, it, it is complex because low mood can be linked with lots of things, but it's, there's a definite link with the menopause. And so I would, would say that, you know, low mood can be due to low self-esteem. If you go through the menopause, you may have, you know, changes. There's lots of things going on, you know, at my age, <laughs> almost the same age. So you've got your kids growing up, you've got elderly parents, you've got work, you know. Yeah. And it may be all related to that, although there is a definite link with the menopause. So I would sort of say... Keep doing the exercise and keep doing the things that are making you feel better, give you better self-esteem. But it, if that's the only symptom, it might be menopausal. So it may be worth trying a course of HRT to see yeah. if it helps. I suppose we, we manage all those things and then maybe something just tips us over the edge. Yeah, and so then, then just yeah. the onset of menopause or perimenopause can be the thing that makes... It makes but I think if anybody's trying HRT, they've got, it's not going to work within a couple of days. You're not going to suddenly think, oh, I feel so much better. It will take about three months to take will effects. It? You've got to be patient because it takes a while for estrogen levels to reach mm. a sort of steady state and reach a peak. So 
Yeah, people can get side effects before then, and you do get people phoning up saying they've got headaches or breast tenderness, and they kind of all that before they get the benefits from it. Oh, right. So the so side effects are very transient, and I would always say just try and put up with it, keep going, see what you, you know. And do they tend to then wear off once they the estrogen levels yeah. out? So it's just. I mean, I've had some women that can. So this breast tenderness is so bad they can barely wear a bra. But that goes within a few months. But right. they'll evening primrose oil can help, so things like that can help. But it just I think it's more it's nice to know that it's a transient thing, that it yeah. should get better. Okay. And I think that really, you know, mentally helps people. Yeah. And then um, what about mood swings? So lady said some days her husband's breathing makes her so <laughs> annoyed. That's normal. <laughs> um, but she wants to kill him. Um, and yeah. then lack of libido. Um, fine by her, but not great for her husband. Mm. Any help would be great for received. So that mood swing thing and lack of libido. Yeah. Or... I think that it's all interlinked. And like what I would always say to people, lack of libido is really complex. It can be that time in life when you're busy, you're tired. And, you know, Brad Pitt could walk into the bed and you still ignore him. You know, <laughs> you think. But it might be, it might be, be hormonally related so my approach would always be to make patients aware that I may it may not be the holy grail but we'd try HRT and I'd always try and get the estrogen bit right so see if I can get them up to a dose that I think is going to be the appropriate dose for mm. them would help them if that's sort of helping other things but not helping the libido then we'd add in a bit of testosterone and that's mm. usually a form of a gel mm. um, and I let I sort of get them to use that for six months and if it hasn't helped by six months, then it's not a testosterone issue. But if okay. it does help, they can continue with it. So okay. that would be, i sort of pragmatic about it. There's no point, there really isn't a whole lot of benefit to continuing with it if it's not going to help you. But if, if it does, then continue. So testosterone is what will govern your libido, and that drops with the menopause as well as your estrogen and everything else. So yeah, but it, does, it doesn't drop as much. So the postmenopausal ovary can still secrete the testosterone, Okay. Whereas um, it sort of stops secreting estrogen before that. So I think that's why women that have, we classically see anybody that's had their ovaries removed, you know, hysterectomy, they often have a sudden surgical menopause and it's awful and they get terrible, often terrible libido symptoms that are really helped with testosterone supplementation because they've lost their ovaries. So yeah. any residual testosterone is not going to be produced. Yeah, sure. Whereas women that still have their ovaries that are sort of fading. <laughs> then they don't seem to get the same loss of libido. They still do, but it doesn't yeah. seem to be as dramatic. Okay, because they're still producing a lot. Yeah, and, and the testosterone doesn't work, often doesn't work as well for them. And often the lack of libido is maybe a multifactorial thing. Like, like I said, you know, you've got lots of things. You feel like as if you, everybody's tugging at you, and yeah. it might not just be the lack of testosterone, it's everything else. Yeah, yeah it's that point you just need a whole mind, day. Yeah. Yeah. Or a wife. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. often think that I think, Yeah, good. I could do with a wife, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so almost coming to the end. So night sweats. What can I do about night sweats? I've tried. You mentioned that before. Mm. Clonidine. Is that right? Yeah. And I'm not in the menopause yet, so I'm not on HRT. Oh, okay. So clonidine is a drug that's often used, classically was <laughs> developed as a something for blood pressure, but actually it then was found its side effect is it helps with flushes. It's not. It's effective to an extent, but not as good as estrogen. I would say I don't mm -hmm. see patients the same response. So the thing is, it, I suppose what's confusing is she's not in the menopause yet, but maybe she means her periods haven't stopped yet, mm. but she could still be perimenopausal. So if she's tried clonidine, I would say try some HRT, and okay. then that would probably help her. Because I think night sweats can be <coughs> awful. Some women get up and have to change during the night, yeah. change the bed clothes during the night, and, you know, I think... For women that can't take HRT, what they often find helps is just practical things like having a, like a plant spray with water in it by the bed, mm -hmm. Or um, you can get something called a chillo pillow oh, or a nice. chillo sheet, which is like a cool sheet. It's not like an ice pack, it's not quite, but it's like a something you can put in the freezer in the fridge and it cools down and then it mm. retains that coolness for quite a few hours. So you can put it under your head okay. at night yeah. or you can get a sheet to put underneath you so it stops you sweating. And would you, would you give that same advice to somebody who talks about not just night sweats, um, but also daytime hot yeah, flushes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She probably does need some HRT. Yeah. yeah, so because that's a massive issue for ladies, isn't it? It's the hot flushes during the daytime. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. just so obvious. And I have one friend, she said it felt like a, a fire, a furnace being lit inside her. And yeah. she would just 
be dripping from her hair so, and everything. And I think that, I mean, it is very debilitating and embarrassing for people. So the, the one other thing I hadn't touched on is there's good, actually it's a ni- the nice guidance that um, prescribing CBT, so that's cognitive behavioural therapy, mm-hmm. can be very effective for things like that. How does and that work then? So I was never, I, I heard two um, experts speaking on it in the summer and it's yeah, really impressive actually. So people can train to do it and I'm going to train one of the nurses in our unit to do it because I think it's very helpful for women that really can't be at HRT and really, really don't want to have it and mm-hmm. want to have something else. So I'm no, no expert on it but what they described is if you feel a hot flush coming on, you've got it in your mind, you know that I know it's coming and I know it'll finish yeah. and I'll just keep talking and I'll breathe through it and I'll be fine, and nobody's looking at me, and the, it's a way oh, of thinking about yeah. things. But actually, I'm not doing as well as they did, but they're very mm-hmm. convincing, and I think for some women, it probably works really well. Okay. And it's been shown to be very effective. It's one of the things we should be prescribing, but you generally won't get it in the NHS. Most clinical commissioning groups won't pay for it, so yeah. most women will end up paying for it themselves. Okay. But if I can train somebody to do it in my clinic, then they could at least come and see us for that. Yeah. Yeah. But otherwise, then, estrogen seems to be the Estrogen, thing. yeah, it's probably the most effective. Um, difficulty falling and staying asleep? Uh, that, I think that's, that's all to do, a lot of that's to do with anxiousness, and that's to do with menopause. Um, you, your mind starts working over time and you can't sleep. Funny, I just really want to go and try it for three months. <laughs> I don't necessarily feel that I have any major symptoms, but there's probably a combination of lots yeah, of little yeah, things. Yeah. Like maybe a little bit more anxious, maybe... And I think women do become well more anxious with age. When it's age or menopause, people do they probably think about things more mm. and you don't have that, maybe that sort of, I don't know... Yeah, you become more. Like, you've seen a bit more of life. You know what might go on, and there's things that things that I don't, I don't probably don't worry about work as much as I used to because I'm sort of exhausted by it now. <laughs> but there's other things I'd worry about my children more. So yeah. I think you know people's worries shift, yeah. and then you might lie awake thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so just some individual case queries now. These were slightly more specific. So re prolapse. I have a prolapse due to the menopause. My consultant recommended a repair and hysterectomy. Yeah, I mean, very often that is what will be required. If you're seen by a urogynecologist, they'll examine you. Yeah. I don't even really know what a prolapse is. I know my grandma had one. I don't know. It was all very well, hush hush grandma had a prolapse. I think people feel a dragging sensation or a okay. discomfort. Okay. And you can sometimes see a prolapse, but it's usually not as bad as so that. So what's actually happened? It's the muscles? Yes, yeah, it's, it's the worms basically. So the ligaments that, that keep it upright have sort of started to sag and it's going down. So it can cause urinary symptoms. It can cause urinary incontinence or um or it can cause bowel symptoms because it can press the back passage as well oh. or you can just the whole womb sort of you can just feel a dragging feeling and often surgery is the thing that will correct it physio surgery for older women that aren't sexually active or not suitable for an operation of ring pessary sometimes it's like a donut you put in the vagina mm. it's not it's not really the best thing for somebody who's younger and vaginal estrogen as i said before can help with preparing them for the operation and afterwards it helps healing and so would that hysterectomy involve taking away the ovaries as well and um, or just we usually, usually don't do that vaginally it can't they, you can get the ovaries out vaginally but usually it's just the uterus and okay. if you're doing taking the ovaries out sometimes they need that done laparoscopically from above it's just they're a bit higher but they don't right? have to do it as part of having a prolapse so the ovaries no, no, no. stay there no the and, and sometimes the womb it's not taking the womb out it can be that that lady's been recommended a hysterectomy but sometimes it's just a repair of the there's a prolapse in the front wall of the vagina or the back wall and that's where the muscles are well, basically starting to sag a bit yeah, yeah. and you tighten them up so you're pushing the bladder back up where the bowel backs away because yeah. they're the things they're pushing and that's giving people symptoms Oh. <laughs> you do all the surgical work as well. Not Which that sort of surgery. Sunday. I do. The, it's more fertility surgeries so, or fibroids, but I don't do anything to do with. Yeah. No one's mentioned prolapses. fibroids actually. Yeah. Um, so people worry about fibroids often shrink during the menopause. So a lot of women I see, I'll take fibroids out for fertility reasons, but if they're nearing the menopause, it's not called, and they're not very big. I'd often say maybe you don't need to do anything. Um. But if they're very big, nothing's going to shrink that really. So often they do end up having um, having surgery for it. Okay. Um. So the next question: Does taking the pill postpone or change menopausal symptoms? 
Um, we're taking the pill. So it, the pill is it has got estrogen in it and Probably. progesterone. Mm-hmm. But so if that that's the combined pill, we'll have both in it. But it's a different type of estrogen, so it's a synthetic. It's called ethanol estradiol. It's a totally different type, and you're giving people very high levels of it to stop them ovulating. So the HRT that we give for menopausal symptoms isn't a contraception, it's a much more physiological level. Okay. So it can, yes, the answer is it can prevent you getting any symptoms. So younger women that have been on the pill, they stop the pill, the periods don't come back. It could be that the pill has been masking yeah. the menopause. Older women above the age of 50, we wouldn't normally give them the pill. Okay. You'd change to something else. Okay, okay. A um, couple more questions. I'm sorry I haven't been quite as interactive on here and looking at messages, but I can't read them from can't the start away. <laughs> I'm trying to concentrate on what Lynn's saying, so I don't ask really stupid questions. So this is a really interesting from a lady that I know. Can having a baby bring on the menopause, especially if you're in your early 40s, or is it just a coincidence and it's happened at around the same time? So a lady's had a baby who's nearly 18 months old now, and she says, maybe I'm still suffering from being pregnant, but I have memory loss or forgetful baby brain. I get hot flushes and get hotty easily. Also, my periods are slightly irregular as well. Am I perimenopause or is it just the aftermath of having a baby in later life? Um, so it doesn't bring on the menopause um, and it's probably just coincidence. I mean, you can get er- erratic periods after having a baby. Is she breastfeeding, I wonder? Um, he's nearly 18 months now. Okay, so, so probably not. But breastfeeding, you can get oh, you can get terrible night sweats. I used to have flushes. So I remember oh, thinking I might have lymphoma or something. Yes, you can get I. horrible <laughs> nights. So if she's breastfeeding, that might be why. But if she's not... Yes, it, it, it could be that she's going through the menopause, but it wouldn't be anything to do with, it's just coincidental that she's okay. been pregnant. And then this lady, this was a really interesting one as well, um, she said she'd never had a pregnancy, abortion or miscarriage, so she's wondering if she can expect anything different from the menopause, especially if she hasn't had those big hormone and physical changes to her body. She's 46, definitely in perimenopause, well, and has been on the pill for 25 years, so she guesses her hormones are pretty random. Ooh, okay. Um, I guess if she's not had... I don't think being pregnant before helps with the menopause, really. No. <laughs> I don't think she's going to notice anything very different than anybody that's been pregnant. Or, you know, if she's been on the pill for 25 years, she may get a sudden come off it and get a sudden loss of hormone. I would think that would be the main thing. But the fact that she's not been pregnant before shouldn't really make any difference. No, okay. And then... Our last lady, so, so, okay, so this is a good one, okay, <laughs> I'm suffering, can't sleep, hot all the time, anxious, never felt this before, I had breast cancer when I was 40, oh. and my GP said in passing a few years ago that she wouldn't prescribe HRT, I'd like to know where I can go to look at properly researched data about the risks for women who've had breast cancer taking HRT. Well, if I was her, I'd go to the, I'd go to the British Menopause Society website because anybody from the public can look at it and they will give you up to date data on it. There's been lots of publications, there's been one recently, but what I would say is that I've given you before the background risk, so the background, so her risk is clearly different because she's had breast cancer already. Yeah. Um, so as I said before, most doctors won't prescribe HRT if you've had breast cancer before, but I, if somebody she came to see me, I would probably go through everything with her, see how long it is that she'd had breast cancer, how long she's been in remission for, and we'd talk through the pros and cons, the non-hormonal treatments, hormonal treatments, and sometimes we get to a point where we decide that yes, we'll give it a trial, mm-hmm. and see how, because if she's so miserable, yeah. and it's really affecting her quality of life, it might be worth trying it out. Okay. So, yeah. so the answer is, it's a possibility, it's not absolute no, but most people will say, that they'd be very careful in prescribing it. Yeah, okay. And they talk to the oncologist she's seen before, etc. Oh, okay. But then you monitor people, presumably. Yeah, we do. So but the, the problem is we it. can't guarantee that they're... I suppose what I'd always say to somebody is, I'm not going to... If you if you went on HRT and you had a recurrence, and you, would you blame it on the HRT or would you say it was going to happen anyway? Mm-hmm. And if, if you blame it on the HRT and feel terrible and couldn't deal with that, then it's really not the thing for you. Yeah. Whereas if you were more of the opinion... Well, it may have happened anyway, and I felt so much better being on it and improving the quality of life than it is something I consider. Yeah. And everyone's different, I guess. Yeah, you? everybody's Do different. you see people taking yes, those I've different got, views? Yeah, and I've got several patients that are on HRT that have had breast cancer before and are very happy on it and very mm. healthy and well on it, but they sort of have that, that doubt in the back of their mind, but they, that's their decision, that's what they've decided yeah. to do. 
Is there anything that hasn't cropped up that you might have expected to have cropped up or anything that's just come to light recently that you think people might really benefit from knowing? Um, or do you feel you've covered most of... I think we've covered most of it. I mean, there's the ovarian cancer risk that came up a few years ago. It was in, it was a publication in the journal, but the risk is incredibly low. And it, it, it possibly, if there is an increased risk of ovarian cancer, it, it's around one and it's less than one in a thousand increased risk. So we usually don't even mention it to patients because it's so unlikely. And mm-hmm. um, and the dementia, we're not sure if it helps or not. Oh, yes, so it's true. it's difficult to tell people whether. It, the jury's out really if it's helpful or is not. that something that has been linked then I've not heard um, that. there's always been debates whether HRT helps prevent dementia or it doesn't but we can't really say for definite the one thing I would say actually one thing we haven't mentioned okay I would say ended oh <laughs> maybe we well no it's, people always ask about weight okay there I've shared it okay we <laughs> anyway let's just um, we can finish